got really set back on this one so I only have like 5 pages of material, which means you guys are going to have to put up with me going really slow after an early point. That said, I'm prepared to go all goddamn night if I have to, as this is one of the more tense stories from our Shadow Run campaign. I hope that you enjoy it. Rotten Pizza. Beer. Was that? Was that spunk? Geppetto awoke to a cavalcade of smells. He could feel something squishing against his eyes and mouth, so he deigned to open neither. Instead he slowly, ever so slowly lifted himself, hearing the clatter of bottles, cans, and other assorted detritus as he sat up in his dumpster. It was late in the morning, and even with his health focus activated and minimal sunlight trickling down into the alleyway, he was rocking a killer sunburn, something cool that smelled like shit oozed against his cheek, and he was alternately thankful of and hateful for its presence. Dervish leaned over the edge of the dumpster, his wide nose wrinkled in disgust. He had changed out of his suit into his motorcycle leathers and bandana, and aside from a few cuts and scrapes was not looking particularly worse for wear. Morning, Babaface. I've been looking all over for you, Geppetto squinted up at the street Sammy, before surveying himself, his brand new white designer suit was ruined forever. Brilliant, Dervish. What the fuck happened? You tried to speedball human blood, Novacoke, and Jazz, vomited blood all over some Aztec corpa, and then you passed out and adversary started some shit. The bouncers left you out here when they were done trashing you, lucky banshees regenerate, or otherwise you'd still be out three teeth. Fan fucking tastic, dervish. Good to hear you had my back, where a wildcard and Ben. Wildcard chipped an unfiltered personifix and is currently applying bandages from the first aid kit in his car after a little stint swinging a dislodged bathroom pipe around, thinking it was a sword. Geppetto stood and brushed himself off, a completely futile gesture. Resigned, he began summoning a water spirit as he stumbled over the lip of the dumpster, hitting the ground hard with his shoulder. Oof. What about Ben? Neurotically calling up his girlfriend about a whoring binge last night and telling her that he wants to go steady. Geppetto glared at Dervish as a horrible tentacled monstrosity emerged from the shadows of the alleyway and began hosing him down. I notice you haven't stopped smiling throughout this whole update. I guess it's just really funny seeing you three cut loose for once. Now let's get to the bar to start planning this universal on that edge thing. Can we stop at my apartment first? I smell like a parking garage in Redmond. The team sat at a reserved table at the faulty bar, their usual spot. Brianna McCreary had a few more running teams and independents contracting for her now, and combined with local traffic the joint wasn't quite as empty as it had been. The bartender backup fixer, Abe Heap, was having a loud conversation about guns with a group of street hoods who seemed to just be getting into the game. A large cyberdub troll guzzled Hurg while what was obviously his running team a slim, dignified looking human, a dwarf in steampunk gear, and an orc in a cheap business suit cheered him on. Wildcard spoke first, drawing up a map of the Vancouver Universal Omnat Etch complex in AR space. Here's our target. It's only about 2000 by 1000 feet within the perimeter fence, barely bigger than Alcatraz Island. Of course, it's just as hard to hit. He gestured to two gates in the fence on either side of the complex. These are the entrances, both are open to the public, bottom three floors of the main building are a gigantic shopping mall with medical and pharmaceutical offices, there's public parking adjacent to the main building, since it's technically sovereign territory, there are some checks at the border. Shouldn't be too much of a problem if we all check out. Next, he pointed out a series of unmodified suburb city blocks on the south end of the complex, still within the perimeter fence. This is employee housing. UO bought out a big chunk of the suburban neighborhoods to the south of their building about a decade ago. The higher ranking employees like our doctor, Jennifer Chang, get their own houses instead of the communal living most employees get within the building. Speaking of which, Wildcard pointed at a 3D model of a small arcology, smaller by far than, say, the Sairi, but still ludicrously massive. This is the UO home office, and it's where most of the action is happening. Employees enter through a special security extension that leads up to the fourth story. The bottom three levels have their own elevator system, with only a security elevator for transport between the labs above and the civilian floors. We don't know too much about the exact layout. The main research nexus is probably in the middle of the building, equidistant from all possible entry points, and the labs are probably situated around that, but that's just an educated guess. Geppetto suggested. I think that we need to get Dr. Chang to actively help us to stand a chance. Ben nodded his agreement, plus, she'd be able to sneak things past the security scanners at the employee entrance easier than us. She's a smart woman, 
Ingenious even. She knows she's getting extracted, so she's probably trying to subtly assist us already. Bring up her P2.0 profile. Wildcard obliged, bringing up social networking profiles for Jennifer Chang. They narrowed her down to a single P2.0 profile, a Chinese-American dwarf from the California Free State with a deep love of cinema and a PhD in pharmacology. Her status updates for the last few weeks were insipid. Every day she commented on her lunch, how the guys at the security checkpoint annoyed her, and other minor things. Hold on a moment, noted wildcard. Each of these comments has a date and time. She's just given us her entire work schedule, including when she walks down to the employee housing sub complex. If we want to meet, we can intercept her in between. Geppetto looked between his three teammates. Alright, I'm going to go ask around my contacts about possible ins on UO. Bend, you get to intercept Dr. Chang when she's heading home. Wildcard and Dervish will sneak you in under cover of visiting them all, and they'll also be your backup. Sound good? Wildcard raised his hand. We have a problem, Geppetto. Dervish's only fake sin is it of a Yukus military sergeant, and my best fake sin has me as a migrant from the UK. And nowhere are we listed as having any relation to each other aside from obviously being shadow runners. On top of that, if we compromise those sins, we both lose our best identities. Dervish grunted. Yeah, it'd be a shame to lose Garrett Jordan this way once UO catches on. Some new sins might be in order. Who was that corrupt guy at the registry who cocked up on Tank's sin? He owes us one. Geppetto chuckled. Oh yeah. I think his name was Aiden Romanold. At the very least he owes us a discount considering he makes such terrible fake sins. Well, all in favor of a quick shakedown? Everyone nodded or made grunts of affirmation, and the team set out for their first day's work. As Wildcard and Dervish pulled into the UO complex, they examined their brand new sin data. So, remember, said Wildcard, checking in the rearview mirror to make sure that his sin matched up with his meat face. Detail by detail, I'm Bill McDonatch, second generation American. And I guess we're bounty hunters? With a name like Dirk Steel, I'd better be, grumbled Dervish. These are so fake it's unreal. Well, that's what happens when you threaten to bash down a registry worker's door if he doesn't make you a new sin, champ, countered Wildcard. And besides, these are obviously show names. Anyhow, we're rednecks who changed our names, or something. Scottish rednecks. Hey, American accents are fucking hard. As Wildcard pulled his black sedan up to the border, he and Dervish surveyed the two guards in pristine white ballistic armor standing at the toll booth. Universal Omnitech was a pharmaceuticals and cybernetics giant, and even their graphic design policies reflected cleanliness and surgical sterility. Although the guards were built like bricks and had hardened features to match, the armor made them look like man-sized iPods more than anything else. Wildcard made a point of turning off the Nexus in his trunk before he rolled his windows down. One of the guards, a human with imposing mirrored sibaries, leaned down to look Wildcard and Dervish over. Names? Bill McNatch and Dirk Steele. You're kidding. Dervish grunted. Just cause I got it changed don't mean it ain't legally my name. The guard rolled his eyes, causing the reflection to distort. Okay, sir. Reason for visiting? Combat where? We've got the relevant permits. The guard's brow narrowed at wildcard. Dervish covered. We're bounty hunters. I'm going to need to see registration on both of you gentlemen. The guard produced a portable sin scanner and ran Bill McNatch and Dirk Steele's cards through. He frowned, and ran them each again. Then Dirk Steele again. Putting the scanner on his belt, he drew his sidearm, but made no aggressive moves, at least not immediately. Sir, you're going to need to come with me. Wildcard blinked. You're serious? Not you, sir. You passed twice. The big one. His sin's faulty. This is the third goddamn time this week, grumbled Dervish, stepping out of the car with his hands up. Third time this week or not, sir, we're going to need to scan you with the inbuilt scanner in the security kiosk to make sure you're not sinless. A precaution, sir. Dervish gave Wildcard a pleading look, but gruffly announced. Go on ahead, Bill. This'll get worked out. Wildcard didn't need to think too hard about the hint. Scrolling a message of Stalim across Dervish's field of vision, he pulled into the complex, booted up his Nexus, and began an on-the-fly hack of the security kiosk. Hey, you still have my buddy Bill's card, said Dervish, peevish. You should go give it back to him, the guard sighed. You can give it back to him when your son checks out, sir. Look, I really don't have time for this. The guard stopped just short of the kiosk, 
and turned to face Dervish, exasperated. You don't have time for this, sir. You are going to be spending an entire day shopping for wear. It is 11 in the morning, sir. Unless you're going in for surgery in 5 minutes, you aren't missing a thing. Keep stalling him. Read Dervish's eyes. Look. We're tailing a fugitive. Right now. We think he's going in for wear. We have a warrant. You're interfering with justice. I didn't want to tell you this, but there it is. The guard huffed angrily. You're a bounty hunter, sir, and you're on universal on that edge territory. That means the law and justice are my jurisdiction right now, not yours. I'm scanning your damn card again. Dervish's eyes read. Keep stalling him. As the guard lowered the card to the kiosk scanner, Dervish shouted. Hey, you're doing this because I'm gay, aren't you? The guard mirrored Sibiri's widened and his nostrils flared. He stopped mere moments before scanning the card. Sir, I can assure you that I had no idea. Bullshit you had no idea. You scanned Bill's sin. You saw that he was a gay rights polo club member. Sir, we pay no attention to. You fucking hater. I auto put up a lawsuit. The guard finally exploded the dervish. This is our goddamn territory. You are voluntarily entering our jurisdiction. You have no rights here. You incredible. Petulant shit. The guard slammed the card through the reader, got an error, and slammed it through again. There. You're fine. Get the fuck into the complex. Goddamn. In the parking lot, Wildcard unlocked the doors when he heard Dervish tapping on the passenger side window. That was a close one, big guy. Two seconds let and you would have been toast. Yeah, I get the feeling we may have worn out our welcome with security, so try not to push it. Wildcard gestured toward Dervish's jacket. You got the payload? You know it. Dervish reached into his jacket pocket and produced a live fox, before placing the fox in the back seat of the car. Reaching into his other pockets, he produced a folded up stealth suit, a pair of tactical goggles, a kumalink with subvicals, and a taser. It's all good, bend. The fox twisted, bucked, and exploded into a very naked bend the infiltrator. You dumbasses could have just put me in the back seat. I think they checked there. And don't complain unless it doesn't work. Bend began sliding his legs into the stealth suit. You guys still have time to fuck this one up, especially if you mouth off to any more guards about your deep love for your fellow orc. Get out of my car, you ingrate, laughed Wildcard, stepping out of the Hyundai. He shrugged his shoulders, letting his blazer settle into place. Alright, Dervish, you ready to go shopping? And before you ask, I've already set your Sibias to record, so once we get and go crazy with radar and thermographic. I'm good, hold on a sec. Dervish punched a cred stick into one of the paper space machines, and turned to catch up with Wildcard as a very invisible bend brushed past him, headed for the employee village. Try not to trip any more alarms, Dervish. Shut the fuck up, Ben. The two orcs crossed the street and entered the mall through the main door, and an alarm promptly began blaring overhead. The entrance had a mad scanner. As Dervish was surrounded by white clad guards with shock batons, he growled to Wildcard. If you laugh I'll kill you, sir. Put out your hands. Grumbling and making half intelligible cursing noises, Dervish extended his hands as the guards fitted Razorboy braces to them. I'm assuming that you have a license for those silver blades, sir. Yes, I have a goddamn license. I'm a bounty hunter. Technically this is sovereign territory, sir. You'll need to renew the license. And how much is that gonna run me? 500, plus the 1000 fine. A fine? But I didn't even know my licenses didn't apply. You should have thought of that before you walk through the door, sir. Now cursing like a sailor at the top of his lungs, Dervish began filling out the requisite forms while Wildcard stepped on an escalator up to the second level of the mall. Surreptitiously taking Tridia pictures of the security elevator and guard posts with a handheld camera, Dr. Jennifer Chang was not surprised to be approached by a shadow runner, at least not in the sense that it was something she was not expecting. However, she had to take a moment to adjust to the sudden weight of a cervical microphone settling onto her throat, and to recognize that her eyes were deceiving her, preventing her from seeing the shadow runner that was following her at an intimate distance as she walked home through the security posts. Putting her hand to her throat, she tested out the device. My extraction team, I presume? There was a brief whine as the audio feed calibrated, and a soft male voice responded. One of us. We're going to need a little help. I'll give you everything that Mr. Johnson didn't tell me not to tell you. Protection of his company, and all. We understand. We have more practical concerns, such as the layout of the upper labs and possible extraction methods. I see. 
Well, to start, I have a few requests if I'm going to be collaborating with you fully. Name them. Chang waved to a passing in turn. He waved back with a smile. I need to take my research data with me. There's three years of work on the system, and I don't want to lose it all in the extraction. You help me get the data out and I cooperate in every way I can. Done. Give me an idea of what we're up against. Here, Dr. Chang. Well, to start, there's my two handlers. Equal parts bodyguard and captor. I have carte blanche to leave the company premises, but I'm a valuable asset so they go with me when I'm outside of the UO complex. I'd prefer you didn't kill them. Scott has a daughter on the way and Mike's an okay guy. We'll try not to harm them if it can be helped, mom. What other security are we looking at? You mean aside from UO's private army? There's guards spread all up and down the complex. You've probably seen them, the white suits. There's a small header base on the roof and a couple of SWAT tanks in the lowest level of the parking garage. The windows are bulletproof glass, and there are impact detectors that deploy steel shutters, so don't plan on going through that way. The only way up to the labs from the mall is the security elevator, so you'll need clearance for that. The employee extension has a military quality weapons scanner, as well as a special tag eraser. Of course, my clothes all have UO security tags, the eraser doesn't get those. Most of the middle floors are labs, with the research nexus in the central research lab, but I don't go in there often. The nexus data is partitioned to relevant offices depending on research topic. And the security nexus? Security runs the upper floors, but they've got little enclaves all throughout the building. It's EO's home base, they can't afford anything going wrong, so no hitting the security nexus wirelessly. What is this, amateur hour? Do you think that, if we equipped you with an analog stealth camera, you could sneak it past the security in the employee extension? Ceramic components? No wireless link? Old school film? Of course. That could work. Drop it in the bushes outside my house and I'll have it back by the same time the next day. Excellent. We'll continue pursuing angles on your extraction, Dr. Chang. I look forward to hearing from you. Call me Sean. Using names is bad form for a shadow runner. It's not actually my name. Bend retrieved his cervical and peeled away from the employee village, skulking back towards the parking garage. Wildcard, what's the state of affairs on the mall levels? One security elevator, heavily fortified, all internal workings, probably runs off the security nexus. White coat depots on each level. Have you seen this ceiling fresco they've got on floor 3? It's a mimicry of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel fresco, but everyone has cybernetics. The cybernetics haven't aged well, Adam's reaching out to God with a Louisville Slugger brand cyberarm from at least 15 years ago, but it's an interesting message. I've never been a fan of deifying technology, wildcard, especially not when you're dicking around in an arcology. How's the camera coverage? Total, but no more than one redundant camera for any given angle. If we wanted we could probably jam them, but that's assuming Dr. Chang would be coming through the mall level in the first place. I heard something on the cervicals about getting her research, too, if I'm not mistaken, and that would require lab access. I hear you, wildcard. I'm thinking our best bet to get her and her research is an extraction from the labs through the employee partition, maybe even separately. In fact, I think we should work on getting her research first, and then extract her completely separately, maybe someplace where we only have to deal with her handlers. Alright, let me grab Dervish and we'll get out of here. Don't mess with him too much, he's in a bad mood. He tripped another alarm, didn't he? As I said, he's in a bad mood. The team rejoined each other at their table at the faulty bar, and exchanged information. Geppetto had spent the day calling up contacts, but for the most part his search had been fruitless. Most of his contacts were mafiosos, Raz Corpus, Black Magicians, and Merlin's Gangers or some combination of the four, and none of those gave him any ins on the world's foremost pharmaceuticals and biotech firm. Wildcard, noted Geppetto, didn't you have a street dog contact? You do, too. Have you tried the Jagallo, yet? You and I both know exactly how helpful he'd be, and yes. He asked me if I wanted to buy a third kidney. You spring for it? No, it wasn't fresh enough, but we're getting off topic. Tomorrow you should talk to Dr. Granger, or whatever her name is. Dr. Julia Green. Emily Granger is Ben's girlfriend. Wildcard cocked a thumb in Ben's direction. Geppetto rolled his eyes. It all kind of blends together when you're immortal and don't give a shit about people. Can you follow up on that lead or not? Yeah, I'll give her a call tomorrow. 
The next morning, Wildcard called up Julia Green. Wildcard? Brianna told me you were working this week. What do you need? I was hoping you could forward me to someone. Oh, who's the someone? We need an in on the Vancouver Universal Omniplex Complex. I figured you have your ear to the ground on medical news. So naturally I know every doctor from here to Aslan, am I right, wildcard? Well, it's a long shot, but we figured we'd at least try you. Well, good for you. You're in luck. Sort of. Oh, I've got a girl for you. She was my freshman roommate in college. Not exactly a friend but at least my name will mean something. Dr. Hannah Levine. Wildcard took a moment to write the name down. Okay, and what's the catch? Is she a loony or something? Funny you should mention that. Wildcard gulped audibly. Shorthand for what am I getting myself into between him and his contacts? Hannah's a goody goody. I mean, really a goody goody. Completely incorruptible. She joined up with UO right out of med school to help veterans of the Aztlan conflict and the border wars down in Calfri. She's been trying to create a long lasting synthetic analogue to Dopadrine, the antipsychotic. She thinks it has applications as a PTSD medication for the UCOS Military Veterans Administration. I'd suggest sending Dervish to the Veterans Hospital down in Fort Lewis if you want a convincing cover story. He's got a military sin, right? Yep. You know, you almost not like Dr. Levine being so altruistic. Well, they play it off as a PR thing. Point being, you frame this as a charity move or for the greater good and you're in. Just don't tell her whatever you're actually doing. Hey, commented Wildcard. Faux hurt, what we're actually doing could be altruistic. He and Green shared a brief mutual laugh. Just kidding. I'll see you around, Green. Likewise. Dervish, or rather Sergeant Garrett Jordan of the UCAS military, approached the gates of Fort Lewis on his pimped out Harley. Flashing his sin to the soldiers on guard, he made his way to the veterans hospital. He walked through the doors to find a sad, weirdly introspective sight. A half dozen young man with extensive modifications, all shuddering with symptoms of psychosis as they held appointment numbers in quivering cyber hands. Dervish was blessed with a typo system that adapted to wear easily, but these men had been made into monsters to fight for their nation, and left to rot with the side effects when they came home. Um, Sergeant Garrett Jordan, I'm here for my checkup. The receptionist, a bod looking middle aged orc nurse, pulled up an air window. Sergeant Jordan, we have your last checkup as being years ago. Have you been out of town? Dervish put on his best expression of sorrow and looked down. I've been, I've been looking for a home, actually. Pension ain't much. The receptionist nodded somberly. Take a number. Dervish was ushered into a room with a tired looking doctor, in his 50s. Jordan, Garrett, I haven't seen you around here before. Been transferred? No, sir, just homeless. Dervish maintained the best puppy dog face he could muster. He resembled a pug. Well, what are you in for today? I'm getting the flashback something bad, doc. The doctor produced a handheld scanner. Well, let's give you a brief once over to make sure you're not. The doctor stopped over Dervish's head. He tooled around with an AR window, then moved the scanner around, then took a sharp breath. Oh my god, why didn't anyone take care of this earlier? Take care of what earlier? Dervish's voice rang, for once, with legitimate fear. Some of this synthetic brain tissue is improperly connected. We have nothing on record for this modification. Wait, your skull. The doctor's face contorted in an expression of horror. Did you get shot in the head? Uh, yeah, but a street doc patched it up, so it's all good, right? The doctor stood up, and yelled into the hallway. I need a gurney, get this man to surgery. Dervish exhaled loudly. Who oh boy. Dervish woke up with a fresh new forehead scar, naked but for surgical scrubs, in a hospital bed. The doctor sat across from him in an office chair with wheels, looking relieved. How do you feel, Sergeant Jordan? Ugh. Dervish sluggishly attempted to put his hand on his head, and ended up smashing his knuckles into his face. Given the super dense bone growth added onto his skeletal system, he gave himself a hell of a nosebleed in the process. A nurse quickly wiped the blood off his face. Well, Mr. Jordan, we removed the synthetic tissue and replaced it with a vat-grown substitute derived from a sample of your own brain tissue. You're lucky your typo, you should be recovering very soon. The schizoid manifestations you've been experiencing should be much more controllable now. Skizid, what? When your personality seems to shut off, you probably experience it during moments of extreme stress. Nod recently knew. Shh, rest, Mr. Jordan, 
I'll sign for your prescription when you're up and moving, Prajabhan. Yes. We're giving you a year's worth of dopadrine. It'll be closer to a month for you, given that your suprothyroid will metabolize the drugs quicker, and some immunosuppressants. You're lucky that your condition hasn't been progressing, given how long you've neglected it. Year with dopadin? Yes. A year's worth of dopadrine. Cash register sounds ran throughout Dervish's adult mind as he passed out again. Okay, so we have a possible in, said Geppetto, sitting with Bend and Wildcard across from a spread of Italian food. Geppetto had ordered a glass of wine just for the sake of ordering something, and was trying to choke down little bits of it, his hemivoric metabolism causing him nausea with every sip. I, said Wildcard, sprinkling some pepper over a seared salmon, Hannah Levine. And now we've got an extra edge on her, veterans in need, and a fuckload of dopamine and immunosuppressants. Have you considered that maybe selling drugs to a UO doctor is a bad idea? Bend looked from Wildcard to Geppetto incredulously before slurping up a long noodle of soy jetty, never once taking his eyes off them. Considered it, and decided it's worth the risk, noted Geppetto. We pass it off as a charity thing, even if it's a sketch charity. Bend was nonplussed. What charity? We'll make one up. Is it Christmas yet? We could do a Santa thing. It's fucking October, Geppetto. I don't keep track of Christmas. Too many kids. Okay, how about, I don't know, United Veterans. Geppetto stalled, twirling his hand in circular motions. Wildcard finished. Outreach group. Bend glared at Geppetto and Wildcard. UVOG? Hey, the acronym doesn't have to be pretty. We're a fairly shit charity. Bend placed his chin in the palm of his hand, and gestured one lead to Geppetto with the other one. Well, make the call. Geppetto frowned at Bend, flipped out his cum link, cleared his throat, and called Hannah Levine's office number. After three rings, there was a female voice on the other end. Hello. Hello. Dr. Levine. Yes, that's me. Who's this? My name is Michael Salvatore, and I'm calling on behalf of the United Veterans Outreach Group. We have a charitable offer that we believe you'd find amenable. A UVOG? T-U-V-O-G. Dr. Levine. The V is part of the acronym. There was a dull thud as Ben's face made contact with the table. Geppetto shushed him silent. Look, Mr. Salvatore? This is really unorthodox. I'm going to look up your website real quick. Wildcard and Geppetto briefly made panicked eye contact before Wildcard hissed out. Bollocks. Wildcard turned on his wired reflexes, mashed his mask onto his face, and began spasmodically talking in his chair, bringing up an impenetrable cylinder of at least 30 AR windows around himself. His knuckles snapped loudly with the unearthly speed at which he began typing, while all 10 of his agents activated their edit programs in concert. Wildcard's fingers gestured out a symphony of hasty web design at the speed of a fast-forwarded VCR. Three seconds later, the team had a website of approximately the quality of a sweet bro and hella jeff comic you'll see we come very well recommended i see who exactly is dr lawsolet he's a very talented man with a few character quirks that are irrelevant to this conversation also a foremost expert in the field of reconstructive surgery i think i read the quote you're attributing to him in a periodical but in the magazine there were less typos all errors are reproduced as submitted mom what exactly was the offer you were going to make me, Mr. Salvatore? Dopadine and immunosuppressants. A year's worth. We know you've been doing experiments on synthesizing a longer-lasting dopadine derivative fused by veterans suffering from PTSD and other psychotic disorders, and we want to support that cause. You, really? Whoa, this changes everything. We're glad that you understand, Dr. Levine. Would you care to meet tomorrow, at a restaurant near to the UO complex perhaps? We can hash out some details there. That sounds excellent. Oh, and, Mr. Salvatore? Yes, Dr. Levine. Your website is US Vogue, or Veterans United Outreach Group. Oh, silly me. I'll see you tomorrow, Dr. Levine. Yes, I'm sure we can make a deal. As Dr. Levine hung up, Geppetto angrily prodded at Wildcard with a fork. Geppetto strolled into the unremarkable bar and grill scanning the patrons consciously for any sign of a UO presence. There was one heavily augmented human at the bar. He had Dervish sit at the bar to keep his eye on said human. Dervish had bandages on his head and wasn't taking to the painkillers so well since they'd sprung him from the veterans hospital. So Geppetto figured he'd stick the big guy with an easy job. Wildcard and Bend were outside, monitoring communications from Wildcard's car with a signal scanner, and also keeping an eye on foot traffic.
The bar and grill was as safe as it ever would be. Geppetto cautiously approached a young doctor sitting at the booth by herself. Hannah Levine was a human barely out of grad school, blonde and rosy-cheeked and insufferably naive. She wore large sunglasses and a thick coat, as if those made her less conspicuous and not more. Are you Mr. Salvatore? Yes, Dr. Levine, said Geppetto dropping his white noise generator and you have by now doubtless figured out that we're shadow runners. Levine looked by the side of the booth, as though she were in a bad spy movie. What do you want for the drugs? We want access to the research database. Levine immediately hardened and withdrew, leaning back in her seat. Why would you want that? Seamlessly, Geppetto transitioned. Believe it or not, we're runners who actually have a veteran among our numbers. One of our fixers gave us good intel that UO is withholding a next generation and to psychotic because imitators would jeopardize their stranglehold on the veterans administration. All this at the expense of good soldiers. You want to sell it? We want to publish the chemical formula for free on the Matrix. Levine's face was one of unadulterated starstruck love. I need to, I need to think about this. Take your time, Dr. Levine. Over cervical, Geppetto commented to Wildcard and Ben. This looks like it's finishing up. You two should go get that ceramicum. We'll stick around till you've called a taxi for you and Dervish and made it out of eyeshot, boss, commented Wildcard. I'm getting some weird readings here. I think there's an invisible mage in the alleyway out back. Tense, Geppetto and Dervish made their way out to the street corner and called a cab. Wildcard and Bend watched as the cab peeled away, and then the sonar outline of the invisible figure slowly dissipated. This is all kinds of weird, commented Wildcard. Over the team's tactical network, Bend and I are going to get that camera into the employee village tonight, but you two better lay low. What were the plans for the camera again, Bend? Bend responded. Already ordered it from my spy toys dealer. Ever heard of a guy named the Eyes? Can't say I have. Good. He chloroforms you and takes you to an undisclosed location before he lets you order, like a goddamn nut. Lucky for you I got this order out of the way while Dervish was having surgery. If you see a grey and marked Stefan dropping off a package, avert your eyes or he'll probably shoot you for being a witness. Brilliant. There a place we're meeting this mystery Stefan? Yep. Parking lot back out by the suburbs. You should probably just stay in the car. It was close to 11 at night when Ben returned to Wildcard. In his hands was a tasteful, unobtrusive Chinese-style hairpiece with a patterned bauble on the end. Here's our camera. Don't ask me what I had to do to get it. Wildcard looked over the hairpin approvingly. Nice works manship. You'd never know it was a camera. Bend brushed a thin layer of grime off his taxuit's shoulders. Yeah, only the best for the eyes. Now comes the fun part, getting this into the bushes outside Chang's house. Well, that's on you, buddy. I'll park in the burbs outside the complex. I'll be there to drive in real quick if you need me. As per usual, Ben gets to do the dangerous part. Let's get to it. As Wildcard and Ben pulled into the suburbs around the UO complex, something was off. There were lights on on the helipad and movement on the ground. The rumble of heavy duty engines broke the ambience of the night. Ha. Huh. Must have been a security breach. Don't get yourself killed. If security's been up to round the village, bend, then return to the car. Also, activate your signal scanner, see if you can't make heads or tails of the situation. Roger that. Ben pulled down his goggles, hood, and mask, before Gecko gripping over the perimeter wall. Beelining to the employee village, he found that security in that part of the complex was roughly the same as always. However, his scanner was picking up a massive amount of traffic. UO was wide awake this night. Suspicious, he dropped the camera in the bushes, twisted a few flowers off to mark the camera's location, and then snuck towards the main arcology. His signal scanner picked up a broadcast from a mercenary commander, whom he could make visual contact on, gesturing to dozens of white armored soldiers in front of a stalling VTOL. Repeat, this is not a drill, we have concrete proof that this is an attempted detastial. We fuck this up, and it's everyone's jobs, maybe even some lives. We have three suspects, Ook. Male, tall, goes by Dirk Steele, last known location, Seattle, Tacoma, elf, male, awakened, goes by Michael Salvatore, last known location, Seattle, downtown, human, male, goes by Bill McDonach, detected in the suburbs 10 minutes ago, Chopper 9 should be receiving clearance any minute, speak of the devil, a phantom attack helicopter buzzed low over the heads of the mercenaries, spurring a raucous cheering, you have your orders, Gentlemen, get to it. Ben took a moment to fumble for his subvocal. 
Wildcard. Drive. What? Fucking drive. Oh shite. Wildcard leaned out of his side window to see the white painted UO attack chopper buzzing low over the rooftops, its minigun barrel spinning. Oh, shite. Wildcard let his Scottish Brock get the better of him as he gunned the engine, flipped all four turbochargers, popped a burst of nitrous, and began roaring through the suburbs as his car spat flames from its rear. Holy fucking shite. Wildcard tripped his wired reflexes and began spinning the car into tilting turns through every narrow thoroughfare he could manage, as the helicopter slowly got closer. He was burning for the sprawl of Vancouver, trying to put buildings larger than two-story houses between himself and it. Vancouver was still a few miles away. With its powerful targeting computer, the minigun achieved lock and began peppering away at Wildcard's car. Every time he ducked behind a house, it had to take a moment to recalibrate, but would swiftly reposition itself and begin putting holes in his hood again. Luckily, Wildcard had invested in a preposterous amount of stealth armor for his vehicle, but the hood wouldn't hold out for long, regardless. Lights turned on, sparsely at first, until the entire suburb was lit up. Someone in the distance screamed. Being that off was the general direction in which Wildcard wanted to fuck. He threw himself onto the freeway and began hauling ass for downtown Vancouver, dodging the few cars that were out this late at night as though they were stationary objects. The helicopter followed, although it pulled away to a slightly further distance. Wildcard's Nexus alerted him to an attempted wireless lock. Oh, they're not going to try that. They're not going to try that on a public freeway. There was a distant path noise as flames were shunted out behind the helicopter, and a chrome streak flashed through the sky toward Wildcard's tail. Trailing smoke. Fook me. Wildcard uncorked the rest of the nitrous, turning the highway into two streaks of black and rubber shreds on heated asphalt. Streaking across the pavement at over 250 miles per hour he almost managed to race the missile that was determined to play tag with his car. Well, two could play at that game. Recognizing exactly how much this was about to suck, Wildcard slammed on the brakes and threw his car into a tailspin as the missile soared just overhead and then smashed into the asphalt in front of the car. It exploded when it was still 4 meters out from Wildcard's car, and the force still removed what was left of the hood and blew out every glass surface on Wildcard's car. The car swerved to the left, tilted, hit the crater that was once a chunk of road, and corkscrewed through the air nose first for two rotations before smashing down back onto its wheels. Acting on pure adrenaline, Wildcard gunned the engine again, and responded to the barks of the powerful racing model with thankful tears as he threw his new convertible into forward motion again. As sirens approached from the opposite direction, the helicopter tilted back, and then there was a shimmer as it disappeared from the night sky. Wildcard's Nexus, miraculously intact, picked up the swift work of an edit program, its node was being erased. As far as anyone except him was concerned, the helicopter had never existed. A few data searches and a call to Luca later that mostly consisted of screaming and sobbing. Wildcard found himself at an ask no questions garage deep in the middle of urban Vancouver. He had no illusions that this was a safe hiding spot. He'd already spotted the node signatures of three surveillance drones orbiting overhead. However, he was amongst people, awake, witnessing people, and witnesses meant safety. For now, hands shaking as he nervously lit up a cigarette. He used his backup comlink to put in a group call to Geppetto, Dervish, and Brianna McCreary. Jobs off. Run and hide while you can, chummers. UO is coming. Shadow Run Story Time 15's temporary end. I say temporary end because if you can keep the thread alive I'll pick this up tomorrow evening. It's after 3 in the morning here and I promise that I'd help a friend move into his apartment tomorrow afternoon. Until then, Shadow Run Story Time discussion and Shadow Run General. And how long did you say you'd be needing this for? The warehouse manager looked over the cred stick he'd been slipped. He seemed to be trying to find a way to flip through it, as one would a wad of paper cash, and failing. Geppetto did not relish doing business with this man. At least a week. I'm moving between houses and need interim storage. And a shipping container in a dockside warehouse was your first instinct? Geppetto scowled. Friend told me you were cheaper than self-storage. Well, you got that right. The pudgy man pocketed the cred stick and pointed out a long red shipping container to Geppetto, tucked away near the back of the warehouse. That would be yours. Don't go getting into no trouble, you hear? As Geppetto stalked toward the crate, he could swear that the man winked at him. He threw open the doors of the container and was greeted by the foul stench of human offal. There were makeshift mattresses, morag piles, really, on the floor. 
There was a bucket overflowing with shit in the corner, surrounded by flies. Geppetto grunted in disgust. The prior tenants could have at least had the decency to clean this out. It took Geppetto around an hour or two to begin getting bored. His Kumalink was compromised, so he couldn't even play with it to keep himself entertained. Magic could only go so far, too. It took a lot out of him. And to top it all off, he had no idea if his team was alive or dead. He turned gaseous and drifted about the stockyard, eyeing the dock workers. It was early in the morning, which meant that bleary-eyed workers were just beginning to drift in for work. That was good. Geppetto needed a messenger. Materializing atop a large stack of shipping containers, he spied his target a worker, separated from the others, untangling a long length of chain. He called up a control thoughts spell, and forced his will upon the man's mind. Look up a woman named Brianna McCreary. Tell her that the bat is in his cave. Ask her for a head count. Write her answer in chalk on the pavement by warehouse 6. The man clutched at his head, as though in pain, and then began looking around. Wildly, Geppetto knew that mistakes had been made when the dock worker stumbled towards other workers, pulling out his comlink and yelling to his comrades. Someone just done tried to fuck with my head, Geppetto grimaced. It was a thing that he was doing a lot of lately. That could have gone better. A lone kangaroo approached the back door of the faulty bar. Despite the fact that kangaroos were not native to Seattle or, in fact, North America, this was a most incongruously stealthy kangaroo. It was, in fact, an invisible kangaroo. Were one to see said kangaroo which they wouldn't, because it was invisible, one might suspect that it was not, in fact, a natural kangaroo, but rather a chaperchange myzad choosing the form for its capability to pouch valuable mission equipment while still running at 40 miles per hour. The invisible kangaroo snuck its way through the back door in the kitchen, then carefully up the stairs towards Brianna McCreary's office. However, just as it was reaching for the door, there was a click from behind it. You pinged on Sona, Mathefica, growled a deep voice. Turn around slowly. The kangaroo dropped invisibility. Kangaroo? With a noise best described as sclorp, the kangaroo turned into a naked Ben. His clothes shot towards the ceiling comically as his pouch rejoined his stomach. Squeezing them upwards at a high speed. It's me, idiot. Oh, fuck. Sorry, bend. Dervish put his shotgun back in the shotgun scabbard on the back of his armor, deactivating his ruthenium polymer cloak. Chuckling softly at his own paranoia, Dervish grabbed the handle on Brianna McCreary's office door before the entire door exploded outward with a cablum. The wind flew out of Dervish's lungs as he fell flat on his ass with an equally loud clank, snapping one of the floorboards in half. However, Given that Dervish was wearing articulated heavy mil-spec armor, he was left with a few dents and scuff marks on the paint job but not much else from the two shells of buckshot and the shrapnelated remains of the door that had struck his chest. Bend stuck his head through the new hole in the door. I little on edge, Brianna? You always been asking about you. Brianna stood up from behind her desk and nonchalantly began reloading her shotgun. We gathered, grunted Dervish, just walking clean through what remained of the door rather than bothering to open it. They've got snipers outside, wanna keep those cloaks up. Make for the barons, they won't follow you there. Brianna pointed towards her work nexus, which was turned off. Comms are compromised, so keep out of contact if you can. I'll work on clearing this up. Till then you lay low, good? Bend and Dervish nodded in concert. Dervish, please tell me that you have another vehicle aside from your stupid fucking bike. Well, Brianna sighed. Better make a sprint for Redmond, then. You sure you ain't been followed? The mafioso looked behind his back nervously as he walked wildcard behind a Renton public school, passing by a few children just leaving the playground for pickup. I'm sure. Had to hack three different drones but I'm sure. Cars parked in a parking garage in Auburn. Plate switched. Silver paint job. Had the whole car emped to kill every tag I called a mist. Where's the safe room you promised me? Not to sound ungrateful to Luca or some such. He's really bailing me out of a pickle. Here. The mafioso approached a boarded up door in the back of the schoolhouse, and pulled a few of the boards free. The smell hit wildcard. Did someone die in here? Yeah, back during crash 2.0. Teacher was wired into the school network. It used to be a pay closet but the corpse became a biohazard before city services could pick it up. So they just kind of boarded it up. Should get wired matrix access just fine, and the room isn't included on maps anymore so you'd need someone to actually come looking for this specific hidey hole to be in danger. Sounds good. You want beer money for your troubles? That'd be great, chief. Wildcard tossed a cred stick to the gangster. 
forget you ever saw me. Standard Corp emergency policy is to move sensitive data by courier, and that's probably got me locked down till they've got it all sorted out. Fuck. Geppetto ducked back into his shipping container. Alarm screamed from all directions, the siren call of the police interceptors circling the docks. There were Department of Paranormal Security cops, essentially awakened super cops in sexy trench coats and with good publicity, all over the dockyard, throwing containers open, one by one. Geppetto should have paid more attention to wiping his astral signature control thoughts was an illegal, illegal spell. It was only a matter of time before they caught his aura. Geppetto was a manipulation magician first and foremost. These were hunters. Combat mages. Ex-military, mostly. And nothing screamed good publicity like taking out a Black Lodge member. Geppetto had no intention of becoming an advertising campaign for a bunch of spoiled magicops. He was taking the inevitable into his own hands and wringing the life out of it. Ironically, the first step was letting go. He stepped out into the hated sunlight, his mind dulled to the shouts of the cops as they raised their guns. His gun was deadlier than they could even conceive of. He put his fore and middle fingers to his chin, and pulled the trigger. A control thought spell rocketed through Geppetto's brain, screaming one word, sleep. Geppetto slept, he awoke. A not a bad one I have to say, although as after all it is Shadowgun week so we're going to be getting as many videos out as we can, 5 episodes of Shadowgun which is way more than usual, hopefully I get 5 videos done at the minute, <laughs> the minute of this recording this is only the third one I've made, so like, uh, <laughs> let's hope I got 5 out, <laughs> you know what I mean, I best fucking get 5 out, uh, but no, like, uh, hope you boys enjoyed it, and like, you know, like, if you're not really all that into Shadowgun, I won't be too long, I'll be back very soon and we'll be back to 40k and D&D &D light ups and maybe a few other bits and pieces. I want to do more green text videos. Haven't done a green text video in a wee while and like, you know, it's always it's always good to break it up, you know, otherwise if you do the same thing all the time it can really just get to you, you know. Um, but look, I fucking love Shadowlon. Um, as they always say, like, you know, isn't this like a thing? You have to say, like, you know, subscribe at the end of the videos. Like, you know, yes, yeah, so like, you know, subscribe, but like, you know, this has been going for ages, so like, you know, how are you how are you here if you haven't if you're not already subscribed i don't know look anyway i'll talk to you boys later and i'll be back soon all right if you haven't already check out my red bubble portfolio you might just find something you like just stop just stop it stop no just stop it It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!